Yeah, I have uh, the honor to introduce our first speaker uh, today, uh, which is our dear organizer, Pierre Romeos. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, what kind of generation or evolution of freedom can we find in the works of Homoli Chauvin. So, without further ado, I'll take yeah, Thank you very much, Philippe. So, first, I have to apologize because due to the organization, I had to change my subject <laughs> because I didn't have the time to work on the subject I wanted to talk to there. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I prepared something else uh, which I already know more, and uh, which is actually this title. Okay, so the title, the new title, is What Exactly Does Omori Shozo Means by Kotodama Ron? Uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, very uh, strange things, which is Kotodama Ron, basically. Uh, in order, the objective of today is uh, very simple. We're going to address a major EC uh, written by Omoe Shozo. Uh, the date is here, uh, 1921 and 1927. Mm -hmm. The EC uh, title is Koto Damaron, Kotobato Monogoto. Uh, we will investigate the uh, translation trouble with concrete examples. Uh, those concrete examples will be the soul, spirits, and earth, which is a translation problem, uh, power language and words. You see that uh, we'll try to see what's the difference, uh, but finally we don't really <laughs> arrive to a certain conclusion. And we're going to try to understand what is the magic uh, uh, which is behind the Kotodama. Uh, so we'll investigate the text in itself, and of course if, if investigate the major concept that we found into that text, which is Tachi Araware. Um, and Tachiaware, which can be actually translated by the word of appearance here. But I will explain more later. And of course, we will try to understand what the magic could be. So, in order to do that, uh, I prepare prayer seven chapter. The first is the translation issue. The second is the magic and language relation. Uh, the, second, the third is the language forces. Uh, Fourth is uh, just really going to have a close look at what uh, the um, basically the text contents, uh, and then um, on the fifth uh, stage we're going to talk about the appearance, and uh, just after the representation uh, with the language functions and the conclusion finally. Um, so uh, in order to uh, have an audience friendly talk, I just uh, pump up the uh, conclusion here, uh, so that you know where we go. And we're going to, um, basically the conclusion that the magic found in the work of Omri Shozo is not related to any div div divination or mystification. Okay, this is not related to it. And it's not related only to language. For those who doesn't know, uh, Omori Shozo is a um, philosopher who is uh, working on the science philosophy and who is uh, working with uh, uh, language philosophy as a more like kind of analytical philosophy. Okay. Uh, so uh, another key key point here is the general idea that I want you to keep in mind when we're gonna work together is during these twenty minutes. Uh, the key idea is that Omori Shozo focused on questioning conventional view of science and metaphysics, as the panel title uh, says, which he considered so focused on objective facts that they overlooked the way in which subjective frameworks influence the construction of objects. Okay, so um, the object is here which we're going to call a fact, basically. And uh, the subjective framework is much more here. Okay? And we do construct the object in our heads, basically. <coughs> um, so where the essay can be found? It is in the third volume, which is the here, that one, uh, of the complete work of Omri Shozo. The title of the book uh, is Monoto Kokoro. Uh, which is uh, things and spirits, and what we have to know about that is basically that Bomori works art he, he, he wrote article, and ten years later he compiled the works, 
and put it all together in one book and put a title on the book. So this work is particular. It's not, uh, he's not writing a book on, on, on one way. He, so it's composed by a multiple essay on the relation between perceptual world and the scientific world, or how scientific analyze and uh, understand the uh, perceptual world. Uh, the, the, AC, the AC that we will be consider uh, is um, the start as the second period of Omri Shozo, as Omri Shozo has third per period in his cells, the youngest, the mature, and the oldest. Uh, and the work is uh, slightly different between the third per period. The first period is much more about logic, uh, and the second is much more about perception, and the third is much more about time. Okay. And so the starting point of the, the second per, um, period starts with this uh, text that we're going to analyze together. Okay. Uh, so the translations issue. First, when uh, we look at the translation of Kotodamaro, Kotobato Monogoto, the translation we found in English literature is an easy on the spirit and uh, of language. Of course, there is many words we're missing, so you can understand here that we're missing a lot of information, and it's kind of strange that the translator just, just decided to translate it that way. So we're going to see uh, how we can work more, a better translation, basically. So Kotodam Aron is, um, uh, within a Japanese language, is a magical theory of, on the soul of language, words. Language can be uh, changed by word or language can switch. Okay. It's a theory, uh, it's also a theory on speech or words. It's a verbal or word magic and it's the energy of parallel or words. This is those four translation is possible and you can either ch change word or languages by the Kotodama. And uh, it comes of course from a uh, much more older concept in Japan and Japanese, which is Kotodama here, written in um, Chinese character, which is actually a Shinto concept that gives the spirits found in language or words the belief that the, the, the belief that the pronunciation of a word affects the course of all things in the world. And so, by basically, uh, here we have a picture. Uh, uh, this is a, a girl who's just saying things, and she do believe that when she's saying things, for example, the grass gonna grow, grow up very uh, quickly, or something like that, just because she uh, pronounced a sentence in the right in the right way. Okay, this is an old belief into the Shintoism way of seeing things. And next one, so we have that part we haven't uh, translated yet. Uh, so it's kotobato monogoto. What's a koto in uh, in uh, Japanese? is kind of complicated because you've got uh, three different possibilities, which is uh, this one, this one, and this one. It could even be in things or events or state of offers and words. It can signify the non distinctions that lies between different between subjective name and objective things, and between sense and reference. So that's very different. And Koto can also be in understand, understand as uh, it, it is contrasted to uh, mono or thing, and uh, in the sense of an external object of the world. So, uh, and there is also this um, expression uh, in Japanese which is uh, monogoto, which is the totality, the totality of things, things that are uh, four monos, okay, that can be everything, basically. So here we have um, already kind of a, a, a game, a, a word game, because uh, he, he says things and things, but these things can be words, can, can be, can be um, language, can be uh, related to everything. So, he, he does a game with that expression in order to um, basically attract the Japanese uh, public 
to understand what he, he does, basically. Is that okay? <laughs> so, uh, about the language force, we have to know that in Asia, the power given to writing still remain uh, in very uh, much uh, different places. The popular belief in divination force found in words that could affect the world is very strong in Asia. Uh, you can find that in uh, China. Uh, there is a marvelous book about that uh, written by Françoise Lowart in the uh, Royal Academy. Uh, and I'm going to give you the example so you, you will understand why. So in Japan, the most popular image might be the talisman, like Ofuda or, or Mamori. Uh, in, so here is the um, Ofuda. Uh, and basically, people just hang it at the house uh, in order to protect them house uh, from bad things. Okay? So it's words who protect them, um, them home, basically. Right? And you've got also the omamori. Omamori, so for those who doesn't have been to Japan, they know uh, that we go to the temple and then we receive a, a small omamori that usually is being used for six months or one year uh, in order to uh, have a good luck in the future around the things that is written on it. Uh, so the belief that uh, basically on words that affect uh, the concrete world is there, right? So that's the whole idea. In Omori Salt, this fact is described as follows. A koto, which is a word, called the existence of a koto, which is a thing, okay? This is what happened. So he plays with the world and the things, and everything works together. There is a relation between words and things, basically. So this is the idea. OK, so let's have a look at the essay. This belief in the power of words, basically, the belief in the power of words, is not only a Japanese phenomenon. The belief is strongly embedded in our daily life and unconsciousness. And that is not only in Japan, that is for each of us in all of our culture, basically. We believe that things that are being said to us are real. Basically, when I'm saying that there is a, a desk here, you believe that there is a desk. Okay, but what that desk is, that's the question. And following Odgen and Ricard's thesis, which is here, which are the guys who are basically at the very um, starting point of the philosophy languages theory, um, the problem of human communication arises from the fact that listeners, in the broad sense of term, have an inclination to take the words which constitute the parole of others as actual and real things. Okay? But the word doesn't have this canonical meaning, actually. In other words, words themselves in themselves do not have any performativity. Okay? A word is not basically the word desk is not a desk. That's why oh, no, it's very simple. Desk, the word desk that you hear now is not the desk. The desk is there and the word I'm saying and that you are hearing is a different stage. Okay? So but Omari will recognize the performative performativity of language in the sense that this faculty of communicate, communicating through, through uh, language and words is only a way to come to an end. Basically, when I'm asking something to somebody, uh, I'm using language. So I'm trying to get something from you, whatever so it is. It could be the information that actually I saw a desk, so I give you the information that the desk is there, and I'm feeling happy about the fact that you understand that the desk is actually there, okay? So this is the only performativity of language, but the word itself doesn't have any performativity. It's totally different words, okay? You have to separate it. So in that sense, words, which is here, are passive. They don't have any active uh, uh, stage. So the passivity, the passivity, uh, passive, passivity of words 
can be uh, described as the sentence here, which is a very complicated sentence translated from uh, Japanese, uh, from coming from the Ise. And he says that when we describe something in a sentence, there isn't any physical things. Okay, when I'm talking, there is anything physical things. And what appears to us in a direct way is fact, only fact, in which object, uh, for the German one, is the Gegenstand, in itself or any representation, which is the Vorstelling, can be found. So there is no representation and there is no object at all into our words. Okay? And this kind of ID comes basically from Wittgenstein here, uh, uh, which uh, Omori did read a lot, basically when he started his career for like the 21st year, uh, he was called the Om Omorischian, like the uh, Wittgenstein. So everybody thought that he was more of Wittgenstein a person than Omori, basically. And uh, the, um, it comes from so the Tractacus, uh, Philosophicus, so that I, I guess you know. And the uh, word is, the limit of my language means the limit of my world. So basically, all the, the, um, the words and the language that I use are inside my body and no, 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 nowhere else, okay? It's not there, it's not in your head, it's inside myself. All the words I use is myself. And I, I know it's kind of a bit difficult to understand right now, but uh, I'll, I'll give you more information about that. So, uh, in order to understand this sentence, we will first look at the uh, uh, concept here, which is appears, uh, or appearance, which in Japanese is tachi araware. And then we will um, work on the indirect way, which is uh, jikani. Okay? So, appearance, or jikani tachi araware. Uh, first, we're going to have a look at the Tachiyawairu, which is here. Uh, it's, uh, have, this concept also has a strong impact on the Japanese consciousness, because uh, when you hear the, this uh, word, basically, you have heard the Alawariru, that can be translated as appearance, and then you've got the word Tatsu, which is the action of rising. Okay. So there is some kind of appearance that just rises, okay? But you will say there is no appearance that cannot be not seen, okay? When something appears, it appears, okay? So here, when we put the, the word tatsu front of the apparent appearance, it means that the apparent appearance does appear even much more quicker or even more, more stronger, okay? That's the feeling we have. And this appearance of something rise suddenly and directly in front of us, our spirits, or our consciousness. Okay? So the basic idea is to speed up the way in which an appearance appears by this expression here. And what is funny about that is the fact that when you put jikani in front of it, it means directly. So it goes like directly, very appears, like everything goes so fast in a very, very high speed way. So the speed in which the appearance appears is multiplied three times, basically. Which is, anyway, like an appearance, an appearance appears like directly and not, not more quickly. It's not possible. But this is the idea when, when you read that, that kind of thing, okay? And what he tries to do is to make a reference to one more primitive one that compose any of us. I mean, the appearance, okay? So the appearance that compose us, uh, well, that we have about the world, is this very, very quick way of uh, receiving things, okay? And, um, and it goes very quick, basically. And it touch our very spirits, but I'm, I'm going to go there. And so now we'll try to see the representation word here. Uh, but before that, um, uh, to give some uh, explanation about this, in other words, this first sentence here, it's, made, it's, it's to explain that the fact take precedence over things. There will be always fact before the things. 
And it, if something appears to us, it's not in any way something else that is not produced by the ego, basically. What appears to us is not the world. What appears to us is the image of the world. And this image is produced by our ego, which is much more stronger than anything. So basically, when I see a desk, to give some example, uh, what I see is a, desk, is, is a desk that I understand what it is. It is my green, it is the desk I think it is a desk. It is not, nothing, nothing else. It's not your desk. Maybe your green might be different of my green, basically. That's the whole idea. And now let's have a look at representation here, because this is much more complicated. But for that, we need to go through a concrete example. And for that, let's imagine someone who is asking for water. This request will be different in that subject that receives the information if it's in the desert, at a pool, or under the rising sun. Okay? So if I'm uh, somebody asking water, the water that he expects will be different for him if he's at the desert, the, at the pool, or whatever. The basically, the request is dependent on circumstances. But in order to obtain the water, each subject in each different situation uses the so supposed same and immutable meaning of a certain proposition. So in desert, he's going to ask for water, and in um, pool, he's going to ask for water. But the water he asks is totally different. If you're in a desert, you're desperate about having water. It's not the same water that you wish to have at the pool because it's just white rising sun and so forth. Okay. So the question here is to know if that Im Im imitable meaning exists or not. Yeah. And Omri answers no. There is no imitable um, meaning of words. The only things that touch uh, Alawale to us, uh, to the subject, is the image that he, the subject has about the water he asked for. That's the only image that exists. Nothing more. Okay? And uh, for another um, example for, for thinking that is for the partition of the music. You know that the partition of a song is not the song, basically. It will, uh, it will the partition is the, the song itself and the partition is totally different things. And if somebody's reading the partition, the partition will make a different song with the different musician. It, it, might, it might be very subtle, uh, but it's different. Okay? Uh, so the language in that, um, that sense is only functional, meaning that it is only there in order to get something. That's what I say. And this is not really new. So language function for Omri is only part of our cell, in the, in the same way that our body members make us move. Language is just a term of a corporal diction. And language is a reaction to a transmission, transmitter, creation delimited by a more profound uh, generate, generating entity, okay? which is the spirit, basically. In other words, it is not the language which is transmitting, but the body, okay? It's not language. Language doesn't have to do, doesn't transmit anything. What transmits something is our body. And uh, the, we, can, we can see that with the semaphore things, okay? With semaphore, basically, people doesn't talk, okay? So, but somebody understands it. And what's the only thing which moves is the body. There is no language at all. Well, there is a language, but the, 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 the essence of the language is, is, is an emanation of the body. Okay? It comes from the body. But that's a not, not really new. So what does uh, Omori trying to do here? He's trying to criticize the dualism found in uh, scientific views. Basically, um, scientists do believe that uh, objects are real, basically, like I do, I do, of course, as well. And language tends to um, make us think in the way that, basically, object does exist 
a part of ourselves. But those objects are actually does not exist out of them ourselves. They just exist in our heads. And um, there is no, no other place where they could exist. So here's the language and representation analogy to understand uh, what I'm just saying. So on the language, we've got body and language. Well, in the representation, we've got spirits and representation. Okay. In the language part, we have language is a production of the body. Okay. Well, in the, the representation, it's a construction of our spirits. It's not nothing in the construction of our spirits. And ontologically speaking, language is not primary. What is primary to language is our body. Okay. And um, this is the same here. In order for the spirit to get to a presentation, the spirit needs to pass by a reflective thinking. Okay? And without this reflective thinking, he could not get to this representation, meaning that the representation is actually not primary. Um, it is a secondary feature that give access to the world. Okay? We, we're trying to basically def define the more um, very primary spirit we have, and the, the more profound spirit we have. Okay? So, in that sense, language is guilty of dualism, and of course representation is, is guilty of dualism. Because Omori tries to say that the, the, the very important uh, relation that we have with the world is only in, into our spirits, and no, 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 no way, nowhere else. So the body is more likely what we look for when we think about what we could uh, be the essence of language. That is what I, uh, I just told. And meaning that the appearance, or tachi araware, is more likely to be deeper in the sense of the spirit we could look for. The first appearance, the very uh, infinite space, uh, speed appear, appearance. Uh, so appearance, of course, comes back. And what can we think about uh, appearance? The appearance is something, in, is, uh, something is always the sight of something, nothing more, okay? But the second step to assemble all those sites, what is the second step to as, uh, assemble all those sites together? It's the fact that we move around the six, the things to assemb assemble. Uh, is the answer? No, of course, because if we uh, move around a desk, I might, I, I might move and have a different image of a desk and then a different image of the desk. That's not the desk. Okay. So the answer is more likely to be a kind of a constitutive imagination that brings the many sides of things together, basically. There is something inside myself who does bring all the parts of the desk together who constitute the desk. Okay? And not to mention that those sides are all direct appearance of the ego that produces it. Okay? It is so an unified imagination that does the job. Okay? It is only imagination who uh, does the creation of basically the desk that I'm seeing. And following that argument, Omori has to categorically and fundamentally separate the existence of things from the factual reality. Okay. So what I want to warn you here, and we are nearly finished, is that Omori is not denying the reality of external objects as we might have believed with George Berkeley. Like Berkeley once feel the temptation to deny the existence of matter, dealing on the fact that we are solipsism problem and that the fact that this doesn't exist out of somewhere else than in my head. But the project is not so much there. It is a question of denying in the right place and without com coming to an absurdity, basically. And the place where matter is, is not outside of my head, is in my head. But it doesn't mean that the matter doesn't exist. It's just trying to say that basically I am the creator of the matter which matter can exist, but I, I do produce it. Moreover, it is rather to attempt to bring our common consciousness to the fact that all existence are dependent 
on our ego that we must understand this kind of philosophy and not in the simple, simple negation of matter. And besides, this is really important, Omori does recognize the value of dualism by saying that it is basically a way to color reality, like, uh, just like staining technique used in microscopy. So here, this is the staining uh, microscopy. Basically, if we don't uh, color it, we cannot recognize what it is. And basically, our language and our way to deal with the world is basically to try to put colors everywhere in order to get uh, order into the chaos, basically. And that's the way we deal with things. And it is just an artifact, basically. But that is not what exactly what happened within, inside our spirits. So, um, hopefully you did understand what I said. <laughs> and my conclusion here is uh, what does, um, why basically uh, Omori call a magical concept as Kotodama, because we didn't explain it yet here. And for this, we're going to take again uh, an example of two person talking to each other. And when some, uh, somebody is going to ask something to another person, basically something will appear, which touch Yalaware, up to that person at an infinite speed. And how, of course, how can we describe, basically, this very first image we have about world, which is far before the representation of world and before the, anything about uh, the world? How can you explain this, uh, describe this phenomenon? What is this extreme speed appearance that is produced? Okay. What produced the, I, I, I keep asking questions, but what produced the pearl and world on others out of this primary image of the world that I have uh, and what does not go through the representation? Well, to me, and this is my thesis, basically, Omori Omer, just remind us that primary movement that we all share when faced with a certain situation is this primary movement of spirits, basically. And we can talk about spiritualization of the world. So basically, I'm giving my spirit to the world. I'm giving the um, what I do see. And the world that I that have in front of me is my world, and nothing more. And it's kind of a mindification, basically. We give mind to the world, and that's because we, did, we do that, that we do understand the world. And that's the appearance that Omori talks about when he used Kotodama um, uh, theory, uh, reflection to the uh, Shinto concept. There is no mystification or divination at all here. It's uh, just the deepest atom of a human mind that trigger out that primary appearance get in touch with the world. Okay? And uh, ten minutes. So to to give an end, what what is very important about all this talk is that basically in common Japanese language, when, for example, you are in front of an ocean and you're looking at the ocean and your friend just asks you, what are you doing? I'm just saying, umi omi. Okay. I'm just saying, seeing, looking at the ocean. And basically, um, you don't need the eye because the eye is already inside ourselves. It's something that Japanese language didn't need to point out because within the culture of Japanese, within the Japanese culture, uh, we all know that we actually produce something and that words do have a reflection of all already myself. So it doesn't appear for that, it might be that it doesn't appear because of that reason. But this is uh, just um, a, a thing and I hope that uh, well, you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, thank you for your attention. Maybe we have Let's maybe have... Uh, so thank you, Pierre, very you much welcome. for the interesting uh, talk. Uh, we can maybe take a few questions, if you have... Um, yeah?
So, uh, if I get it right, uh, for, for Omori, there is no such thing as just one word. There, there are as many words uh, than subjects. Yes, but uh, the big deal here is, of course, how to recognize the existence of orders. Yeah, of okay. course. Because uh, the trouble is uh, to deal about these things that I do construct. So how to deal with that problem? That's a big problem with homework. So yeah, that's 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 a problem. Yeah. That's 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 one of issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, in your point of view, uh, don't you think there is a um, uh, how do I say that? Uh, yeah, uh, an ambiguity, a uh, confusion uh, in homorist theory of uh, representation or language between ontology and physics. Between ontology and physics? Yep. Uh, well, you know where it is, right? Uh, yeah, 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 of course. But, well, it depends on which base you take uh, ontology. If you're taking uh, ontology as uh, a theory about uh, actual matter, and then of course uh, there is a gap. But if you're taking ontology uh, about possible world, for example, uh, then it's not a problem at all. I think. Yeah, but what is uh, physics if ontology is about real matter? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, for, for him, physics is only a way to uh, basically, um, it's like the stained glass uh, microscopy I showed. It's a way to color, color the world, mm -hmm. it's a way to analyze the world, a way to read the world, but it's not exactly what um, the first primary spirits do, uh, do, um, do understand about the world. Or do, it's not even understand, to, to receive about the world. Mm. So basically, this idea uh, would come after, after the representation, after everything. What we're trying to um, explain here is just what does the spirit, the very, very un unexplainable, basically, spirit, do uh, produce and do receive. And on that point, there is no even physics, there is just receiving something, whatever it is. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, one more question, if we shortly um, In my understanding, um, Omori um, uh, rejects uh, strictly uh, the dualism of the world and the ego. And um, uh, to begin with, um, 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 the, the beginning of uh, your, uh, your presentation, you quoted uh, um, a, a commentary uh, from, uh, uh, not, not, not uh, from Wittgenstein, but uh, uh, a Japanese philosophy source book. Yes, so, yes, uh, Written by uh, uh, the translator yes. uh, of, of a short uh, uh, passage of uh, Omori. And I was uh, very surprised to, uh, to read that uh, uh, comment. Um, so he, he, he says something like, uh, the Omori is the, the, what is basic is the not, not the objective uh, fact, uh, but uh, the subjective uh, construction or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, oh, uh, in my understanding, uh, Omori is both critical of uh, uh, objectivity and subjectivity. Yes. So he's not uh, um, advancing the idea of a, the subjective uh, construction of, of the world. So no. that's... Uh, because actually subjectivity uh, should come after representation. Yeah. So of course, in that sense, uh, subjectivity is not even there. It's just um, basically what we do understand. For example, like subjectivity would come when I start, for example, talking to about mm -hmm. somebody else, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be already talking with somebody without going through the representation and things like that. So of course, subjectivity is uh, already 
to be kicked out. But it's a re repre representation, uh, not in the sense of uh, um, the subjective representation of the object. No. So, so uh, it's a, uh, the, uh, what is basic is just an appearance, uh, uh, so, uh, so in his example of uh, uh, river, the Kabul River. Uh, so uh, uh, when we were in Belgium and we imagine the Kabul River, uh, the Kabul River doesn't appear in our consciousness, but the Kabul River is there. Is there. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so it yeah. seems to be that, that that's important. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there are more questions, please uh, ask afterwards. There will be a coffee break. Uh, because we are a bit running late, uh, I wish to ask you to please stay a bit longer so that uh, our next speaker has enough time. And, um, yeah. So, thank you, Pierre, one more time. Thank you.